Today, in our lectures on world religion, we're talking about the religions of China and Japan. And I'm going to talk about different terms for this, Far Eastern religions. So far, we have of course talked about the introduction, the universal human experience of religion, that there has never been a culture identified that did not have some sort of religious belief, either a belief in the supernatural, of, of supernatural beings, of an afterlife, or something beyond the material world. We've talked about Hinduism, the oldest of the current world religions, that is the oldest extant religion, meaning still existing. We looked at Judaism, the second oldest religion, and the first of the great monotheistic religions. Today we're going to be talking about the religions of China and Japan, and I'm going to give you several other terms that refer to these. They are sometimes called the Far Eastern religions, sometimes they're called the Chinese religions, um, because even the Japanese religion of Shinto was greatly influenced by the religious beliefs that came out of China. Um, and so we're going to talk about those today, particularly Taoism, Confucianism, and Shinto. Then, uh, next week we will talk about Christianity, and even though, if you think you know everything about that, please come anyway, because you might be surprised that there's still things to learn. Then on October 2nd, we will talk about Islam, and October 9th is our last lecture. We will talk about animism, New Age, atheism, secularism, and I may do sort of a general kind of uh, wrapping up of everything there. We look at this chart every week because it gives you some sense of the world religions. This is according to uh, date of founding, the oldest being Hinduism, Judaism. Today we're going to be, or last week we talked about Buddhism. Today we're talking about uh, lumping them together, the Chinese traditional religions, which include Confucianism, Taoism, I'll mention shamanism briefly, and also we're going to be talking about Shinto. Now, Something I haven't talked about yet, but I probably should have, there are certain families of religions. Religion, looking at the global world religions, there are three major current world uh, religion families. The one we know best is the Abrahamic religion, that is the monotheisms of Judaism, of Christianity, and Islam. And I list those first not only because we're most familiar with them, but because between the three of those, they constitute three quarters, more than three quarters, you know, uh, more like... Um, well, more than three quarters of the total population of the world are monotheistic. But there are two other major current world families of religions. The second one, which we talked about last week, are the Dharmic religions. Dharma is the word, the Indian word, or the, the, uh, it's a word in Hindi and other ancient Indian languages that means the teaching religion. The teaching religions are Dharmic religions that began in India, that includes Hinduism. As I've said, Hinduism is one of the religions of India, but we gave it its own slot, time slot because it's the oldest and it's the most complicated. Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and Sikhism. Sikhism is actually a combination, uh, a syncretism of Hinduism and Islam, but it is an Indian religion, and so it's considered part of the Dharmic religions. And then today we're going to be talking about the third great family of real world religions, which is called the Taoic religions or the religions of the Far East, especially the religions of China and Japan. And I've called it the religions of China and Japan just because it's easier to understand. You don't need special terminology you may not be familiar with. Taoism, Confucianism, and Shinto, along with versions of Buddhism. I'm going to be talking about that as I go along. Buddhism, when it, when it spread from India into China, it was greatly influenced by various Chinese beliefs during that, that came along around the same period that particularly uh, was Taoism. Taoism, Confucianism, uh, greatly influenced. In fact, there are whole schools of Buddhism that are half Buddhism and half the Chinese uh, influenced religions. And so we'll talk about that a little bit. Sometimes people include a fourth. And that fourth is what you call the Iranian religions. The reason it's often not included is because these religions, which came from ancient Persia or Iran, and include Zoroastrianism, Mandaism, and the Kurdish beliefs of the uh, Yazdanism, you probably have heard the term Yazidi. The Yazidis are a sect within the Kurdish people, a, a religious group within the Kurdish people that have been terribly persecuted by the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, the ISIL uh, people. Also the Alevi beliefs and their others as part of that. Now, these all originated in ancient Persia, what we know of as Iran, but the reason they're often not called a family of religions today is because the populations of them are very, very tiny. There are not many people included in that compared to Abrahamic, Dharmic, and Dawic religions. 
Um, so the Iranian religions, while they are a distinct group, they are very small. And so when you talk about the, the world religion families, they usually will talk about three of them because they're the three biggest ones, okay? Abrahamic, the monotheistic religion, Dharmic, the ones that came out of India, and Taoic, the religions of the Far East, that is China and Japan. Make sense? So I, I probably should have started with that in terms of a general kind of understanding of how religions break out in the world. Again, I've used this chart as well. It sounds like we're getting some rain. Um, we have demonstrated the fact that if I speak up, this sound system will overcome any rain noise. So don't worry about that. Uh, the, the religions we have boxed here, Buddhism, the Chinese traditional religion, Shinto and Jainism, two of those, Buddhism and Jainism, we've already talked about, the others we'll talk about today, these all occurred, we believe, within about a hundred years of each other. I say we believe because there is some controversy as to when Lao Tzu or Lao Tzu, who founded uh, Taoism, technically is the founder, there was a philosophy of that earlier, and uh, Confucius, who founded Confucianism, there is some controversy as to when they lived. There's a range of a couple hundred years, at least. In fact, some people would claim that Lao Tzu never actually existed. But these major religions all came into the form that we know today, pretty much the form we know today, within about a hundred years of each other. This is a very significant time, not just in terms of religion, but also in terms of philosophy. A lot of the very important Greek philosophies developed a their final form. History was invented during this time period by Herodotus and Thucydides, two Greek writers who invented history as we understand it. All of them during this period of time, around between 400 and 500 or 420 and 520, somewhere in there. So this 100 year period is so important in terms of the history of thought and belief, it is called the Axial Age. And that's worth knowing about. There was, for some reason, this explosion of thoughtfulness, of uh, belief during this unique 100 year period. Now, the religions that we're talking about today, the Taoic religions, have always been closely associated with each other. In fact, there, um, I'm going to get into that a little bit more. The Buddhist, Taoist, and Confucianist, all of them occurring about the same time, there is an enormous amount of art, representational art, that features the three of them communicating with each other and interrelating. This is actually um, a print called the Vinegar Tasters, and it represents three um, religious leaders, a Buddhist, a Taoist, and a Confucianist. Similarly, this painting is of Confucius presenting a young Buddha to Lao Tzu, or Lao Tzu, he sometimes is called. Lao Tzu is considered, was thought to, traditionally, to have been the teacher of Confucius. And so here we have Confucius, the student, presenting a young Buddha to his master, his teacher, Lao Tzu. I'm, I'm, I'm always used to calling him Lao Tzu. It's more common to call him Lao Tzu these days. So these three, uh, Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, have always interacted with each other in this part of the Far East. When, as I said, when the Indian religions, of, particularly of uh, Buddhism, and interestingly enough, Buddhism was almost wiped out in India later on. Hinduism and Islam between them sort of took over and it became dominant in other regions, but not so much where it began in India. When the Indian Buddhism moved east into China, and then later into Korea and into Japan, it began to take on other elements. You will recall, I'm sure you remember all the details on this, that two of the major schools of Buddhism are Theravada, which is the oldest kind, that was the original, and is thought by at least their practitioners to be closest to what Buddha actually proposed. And then Mahayana. Mahayana Buddhism began in India, but its primary form that it has today was because of the influence that Taoism had on it. In addition to that, when Buddhism came into China, it, influenced by Taoism and, and Confucianism to some extent, but especially Taoism, it became what, was, what was we know as Chan Buddhism. Chan Buddhism in China, which became the largest version of Buddhism in China, then moved to Japan and it became known as Okay. Zen Buddhism. And Zen Buddhism is very much a combination of Buddhism and the Far Eastern Taoist kind of beliefs. So those three together, Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, they're sometimes called the three teachings. And the conjunction of those three have become an extraordinary, extraordinarily important influence 
on Chinese culture and all of the cultures of the Far East. Um, today, the Chinese Communist Party, which officially is atheistic, recognizes five religions. It recognizes, which means they're legal, although not encouraged, Buddhism, Taoism, Islam, Protestantism, and Catholicism, the five religions. There is, although the Catholicism, the government of China will not allow official links between Chinese Catholicism and Roman Catholicism because of a long history of having a problem with Roman Catholicism in China, um, missionaries and whatnot. But those five religions are allowed. Confucianism is not technically acknowledged, but there has been an enormous push. Confucianism perhaps has had more influence on the culture than any of them. And I'll talk about the relationship of Taoism and Confucianism in a minute. There has been, uh, especially in the 20th century, a massive push to acknowledge Confucianism and perhaps even to name it the official religion of China. Of course, the more, the more adamant atheistic communist rulers in China are not keen on having any religion officially recognized, but there's been a push for that. So let's talk a little bit more about the specifics of these religions. Within Far Eastern religion, also called East Asian religions or Taoic religions, and in some cases they refer to Chinese religion, but that sort of inherently leaves out Shinto, which in Japan, which is linked. There are a number of concepts that they maintain in common. The first and most important one, as you might think, is uh, the, of these religions is Taoism, which sometimes is spelled with a T and sometimes with a D. One of the problems that you run into, things are spelled differently. Uh, if you're talking about the same concepts in China, even various parts of China, or in Korea, where some of these things have gone, they're spelled differently. And you may be reading about two different things and not realize that it's exactly the same. And some of the same concepts, uh, when they moved to Japan, they were given Japanese names, but it's the same kind of concept. But Taoism, whether spelled with a T or a D, is basic to all of these movements. And we'll talk about um, the, the, the specific faiths, Taoism, Confucianism, and Shinto as we go along. So Taoism is the first, and it's believed to be slightly earlier, although they're all in the same basic time. Again, it's believed that Buddha, Confucius, and Lao Tzu all lived during the same time period. The second is Confucianism. Confucianism and Taoism have a long tense relationship, even though eventually Taoism, Confucianism, um, and Buddhism sort of got together and worked it out, the three of them, culturally, and uh, even in the philosophical principles they made, they, they fought for centuries. And the, the difference I get into, Taoism is much more about going with the flow. In fact, the word Tao means the way, the path, the flow of things in the universe. It's sort of, it's sort of the keep on trucking of religions, you know, it's just going with the flow. Whereas Confucianism took the same kind of concepts and has the same principles underneath it, but Confucianism is basically a, a, a set of instructions for how to create an orderly society based upon specific ritual, based upon recognizing your place in society and the needs of society and the requirements of responsibility to the family and to other institutions, and accepting your responsibility and doing what needs to be done. So for a long, long time, the Taoists thought that the Confucianists were way too tightly wound, way too high strung, and the Confucianists felt like the Taoists were way too loosely strung. Reminds me of my, two of my sister-in-laws. One's wrapped too tight, one's wrapped too loose. Um, if Carolyn were here, she would nod her head. She would say, "Yes, that's right." Um, but Taoism is very much about the natural, the flow of things. Confucianism is very structured, very ritualistic, but they have the same underlying philosophical principles. And then you have Shinto, which, and again, I'll get into more details about what these believe in a minute, Shinto being the national religion of Japan. Even though the vast majority of people in Japan would say they are not religious, all eight, more than 80% of them practice Shinto ritual. And so you get this interesting conflict. To many Japanese, being Shinto is part of what it means to be Japanese, just like in the United States, to many Americans, being Christian is part of what it means to be an American. There's a very close similarity there, even though the vast majority of people who, you know, more than, like 88% of the people in the United States who profess to be Christians may not do anything about it. Same thing is true with Shinto. Although more of the people in Shinto, they'll practice the ritual as a cultural thing, whether they have any faith beliefs or not. Now, in addition to that, we have other categories of the Far Eastern religions. As I mentioned, Buddhism, primarily the Mahayana Buddhism, and again, 
all of the statues of Buddha, uh, not all, but the vast majority of them, the statues of the, Bodhis, uh, the Bodhisattvas, remember Bodhisattva, they are like uh, people who have achieved enlightenment, therefore have become Buddhas, enlightened. But they have chosen to stick around on earth in order to help other people. So there are a lot of statues of Bodhisattvas, Buddha, the Bodhisattvas, other religious leaders down through, uh, down through time in Buddhism are honored, they are revered, and from, from any Western eye, it, it looked like they're being worshipped. That was not really part of Theravada Buddhism, the original one. Mahayana, when it moved to China, had much more of a focus on building statues of Buddha and revering the Bodhisattvas. In fact, Mahayana is the, the way of, you know, it, it, it's actually the way to the Bodhisattvas is what it means. Um, and then Zen Buddhism. In fact, China has the largest statues in the world, and they're all statues of Buddha. The tallest statue in the world is in China, and it is a statue of a Buddha. Um, and they also have the, high, the largest pagoda in the world is in China. So, real emphasis on that because of the Mahayana. Then shamanic, uh, or um, the shamanic means the shamans, that they have spiritual leaders and directors. This is much more animistic. You get animism. Animism is the belief that everything has a spirit. And in some of the Chinese religions, and most certainly Shinto in Japan, are very much animistic. The idea that everything has a spirit. And so the question is, how do you relate to those spirits? There are folk religions throughout China that are shamanistic and therefore are um, animistic. You then get new religious movements. There are a lot in the 20th, amazingly, in the end of the 19th and throughout the 20th century, a lot of new versions of this came along and are still being Invented. I mentioned here uh, Kaodaism, uh, Shandoism, and that's one of the ones that you, that is primarily Korean, and in Korea it's called Shandoyu. My Korean's not very good, but that's Shandoyu. And Aikwan Dao and others. Um, interestingly, the Far Eastern religions variously may be interpreted, sort of like Hinduism is, as being polytheistic, many gods, monotheistic, one god, henotheistic, meaning there are a lot of gods, but we pick one to worship, Pantheistic, which means everything is God. Panentheistic, which means God is everything plus a little more, a great spirit beyond the world. Or non-theistic, there isn't really a God. It's just like Confucianism is clearly non-theistic. It is a social pattern. Or agnostic, we don't know. Agnosticism means we don't know. We can't know. So it varies widely in terms of how these things are interpreted, but throughout China, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, some of the other Far Eastern countries, these are the dominant religious beliefs, okay? Now, China. This is a map of China, as you may recognize. I'm sure you all recognize Mongolia up here, India, uh, which runs over here as well, Bangladesh, Nepal here, uh, etc. Okay, and over here you have the stands, as we used to call it, you know, Kurdistan, uh, Tajikistan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, which clearly were, were and are Islamic. So this chart gives you an idea of the way in which those religions exist in China now. It's not an easy picture. Because of differences in terminology in different places, as I've already mentioned, because of differences in interpreting, some of these are philosophies, but some people practice those philosophies in religious ways by worshiping ancestors or uh, animistic spirits or whatever. And there's differences within the same categories. Um, for instance, within these Far Eastern religions, there are groups of people that worship different goddesses of the mythology of ancient China, like Mazu, the goddess of the seas, Huang Di, the divine patriarch of all China. Um, Guangdi, the god of war, Kai Shen, the god of prosperity and richness, Pangu, and many, many others. So there's a huge diversity. It is very hard to draw lines because of differences in, in use of words and combinations of things. Most of these religions are um, syncretistic, which means that they're a combination of things. In Japan, while the vast majority of people are not religious, they practice both Shinto and Buddhism. And they'll do both. Particularly, somebody will profess to be a Shinto, but if somebody in their family dies, Shinto feels it's negative about death and dead bodies and all that. So they'll be Shinto right up until the time that somebody they love dies, and then they'll be Buddhist. Because Buddhism has a much more positive way of dealing with death. And it's very complicated. On this map, 
The big red areas are the Chinese traditional religions, including Confucianism and Taoism, but it also includes various kinds of worship of gods and ancestors, etc. So that's the largest part of China. The yellow that you see here, and streaking up this way, and whenever it's got the streaks, that means it's a combination. There's, there's large populations of both. That is Buddhism. The green over here, closest to the stands, closest to uh, Kazakhstan, Kurdistan, etc., that is Islam. The pink down here, in the southern part of China, are ethnic minority religions, which are more the folk religions, more the shamanistic kinds of things. The aqua that you see streaking up this way would represent the um, Tangierism, it's called. It's a Mongolian shamanism, different than the shamanism in the south. And then the light green in the northeast up here represents the northeast Chinese folk religions. And so there's a huge combination of things, and it gets kind of complicated. You can't draw simple lines. The United States professes to be virtually 90%, you know, 80 to 90% Christian. And then they're just tiny. That's not true in some place like China. And the same thing would carry over. North Korea, of course, is officially um, communist and atheistic. South Korea is significantly Christian. I mean, there is a lot of Buddhism there, but there is South Korea is one of the most Christian countries in the world, along with South Africa, interestingly enough. I mean, in my experience, in my travels, South Africa is one of the places I saw more Christian symbolism and more, you know, reference to evangelical faith than anywhere else in the world. And that was during, when I was there, it was still during apartheid. Um, and then, of course, in Japan, you get Buddhism and Shinto are the predominant ones. Now, common themes in these Taoic religions. First and foremost, underlying everything else, including, even though they have a different word for it, uh, Shinto, is the belief in the Tao, whether spelled with a T or a D. This literally means the way, the path, the root. It means the flow of the universe, the force that is behind every natural thing, the natural order of things. It is the influence that keeps the world in balance and order. Anybody who is from a Taoic religion who went to the, for the first time to see Star Wars went, the force! That is a wonderful way to understand how they perceive the Tao. The force is this kind of unnamed, non-specific thing that underlies all things. And if you really want to be right about everything, how you live your life, your, your morality, everything else, then you get in touch with and you accept the flow of the Tao. And so that is a fundamental principle, even of Buddhism in China and uh, in Japan and Korea, etc. They have a fundamental belief in the Tao. It's not called that in, in Japanese, but it's the same great basic principle. The second one, which you, how many of you all have ever studied martial arts? Okay. You will know the term ki or chi. It's qi or chi, or in Japanese, it's ki. This is the active principle um, that forms all living things. It is the breath, the air, the life force, the energy flow. This is the reason why, the reason why breathing is so important in martial arts. They teach you to breathe in a certain way. They say that if you have, you know, if you're going to have power, personally or martially, whatever, you have to learn to control your qi, or qi, some people pronounce it. Um, again, multiple words for everything. And that involves controlling your breath. Um, uh, Bruce Lee, you all know Bruce Lee. I'm from Seattle, so he's very good. Bruce Lee was considered a master of controlling his chi. In fact, just sidebar, interesting thing to me. Um, he was such a master, he, did, he created his own form of martial art. And he had what was called the one-inch punch. The one-inch punch meant he would stand with his fist one inch from the chest of another person. And by marshalling his key, his force, his energy, he could punch that person and knock them off their feet every time. One inch. And he would say it's because of focusing your chi. He also, you know, he had another example where the guy who won the World Black Belt Karate Championship eight times in a row, knowing it's coming, was that he was unable to stop a blow from Bruce Lee. I mean, Bruce Lee didn't actually hit him, he stopped right here, and the guy could not prevent it. Anyway, that's because Bruce Lee would say he was controlling his chi, or his chi. So, this is an important part of the whole discipline of the Taoic religions, but particularly those who seek a martial, which means a sort of military or 
uh, adversarial kind of uh, approach to it. Although they would say adversarial, that's contrary to Taoism. The third would be the day or te, which is the moral. Now, the um, the key is considered, or chi is considered in all living things. But for a person, there's a special kind of that, which is called a day or te. It means moral character or integrity, virtue, morality, quality, merit, virtuous deeds. And within each of these Taoic religions, they have slightly different definitions of this, but they get to the same thing. Taoism uses different words to define it versus Confucianism versus Shinto, for instance. But all of these are major principles behind all of those Taoic religions, and it all has to do with perceiving the flow of natural order in the universe, learning to discipline yourself to that, and then practicing it, you know, the disciplining of that life force in you, your qi, or qi, and then learning to have that manifest itself in how you live your life, in your actions, which is the day. Make sense? These principles are behind all of the Far Eastern or Taoic religions. You will notice, I haven't said a whole lot about belief. While there are certain beliefs that they maintain, most of these uh, Taoic religions are very much more about orthopraxy. Here's two words for you. Orthodoxy, you may have heard, you've heard of the Orthodox Church. Orthodox, or orthodoxy, means right belief. The monotheistic religions, first and foremost, Judaism, Christianity, and sort of a mixed bag, Islam, are about believing the right things. As many as who believed in him, they were given eternal life. It is more, and now you're still supposed to act a certain way, but primarily those are, are religions about orthodoxy, what you believe. Most of the Eastern religions are much more about orthopraxy, what you do. In Shinto, for instance, it is whether you go through the rituals. It doesn't matter whether you believe anything or not. If you go through the rituals, you satisfy the expectations of that religious system. Okay? So, very different kind of understanding in the East. In fact, the East says, you people, some people, scholars, uh, practice, practitioners of Eastern religion would say, it is not possible for someone who has been trained in the West, who has grown up in the Western culture, our mindset is completely foreign to a whole understanding of how they think about things. And some would say, you can't learn this. Practitioners of a lot of, a lot of martial disciplines, Eastern martial disciplines, no, uh, some of them are very common, judo, karate, etc., but some of the other more complicated ones, they would say, a Westerner can't really learn this because you can't put your mind in the right place because you can't perceive these things in the way they do in the East. So let's talk about, yes? How do you learn Chi? I mean, how would Bruce Lee, how would he do that? I'm sure, they, sure his competitors would like to be able to do that as well. <laughs> so, well, they did, but they didn't do it as well as him. Right, so how, how do you do that? Well, the first is Taoism, for instance, which again is the first sort of root of this, although it was accepted by Confucianism and others. The first root is, is beginning to perceive the flow of the Tao in all things. That comes from meditation. It comes from personal discipline. And once you have begun to perceive that, to, so, you know, uh, um, open yourself to force kind of thing, okay? Then you can begin to apply that and through, that's why I say breathing, because the word chi or ki means breath among other things. In fact, it's one way to translate the Hebrew word, uh, the Greek word pneuma, which means breath or wind or spirit. The, the Holy Spirit in the Christian New Testament is, is, in Greek is pneuma, and there's a similarity there. And so the breath, the force, you discipline yourself once you have a meditative perception of this, of the Tao, you learn to control your breath, you learn to see the force in yourself, and then you manifest that through the te, through how you live your life. Um, Bruce Lee and other great martial artists would say it is not possible to be a non-virtuous person and experience this. Because your day or te, if you were not living a virtuous life, if you were not humane, and we'll talk about some of the characteristics that come out in Taoism in a minute, uh, if you're not doing that, then there's no way you can really develop this. And so one of the signs of somebody who is a great martial artist in, this, in these senses is they will be an extraordinarily moral person, extraordinarily virtuous and disciplined. Okay. So it's a long process. Yes? Some Japanese Christian friends have mentioned this kind of discipline to be in the way of the Taoist religion. Yes. Can you explain that? 
faith, yeah. everything. As for Christianity says, we're not perfect, we're sinful. And right. that has been always difficult, they told me. Right. For Christianity to, to take place there. Right, if you have a faith that is based upon orthodoxy, belief, and part of the Christian belief is that, you know, you must surrender. That it's not up to you, it's up to God. And God has done the work for you in Jesus Christ. That's, that's a fundamental platform of the Christian faith. There is an inherent inconsistency, inconsistency between that and believing in, a, in the, the principles of an orthopraxic religion, which says you have to discipline yourself. You have to, you have, it's entirely up to you meditatively to come to an understanding and knowledge of this and then begin to apply it in your own life through both discipline and through the practice of virtuous life. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be disciplined or have a virtuous life, uh, but if you think that's how you get there, there is an inherent inconsistency between that and the orthodox religions, especially Christianity. So there is a tension there. Uh, there are people who, who are Buddhist Christians or, or even Christians who will recognize that there is a force. Now, that the... Taoism and would maintain, any of the Tao religions would maintain, particularly Shinto, would maintain that there, Shinto would say there is a kama or a spirit, which is very similar to this sort of key, um, that exists in everything, including inanimate objects. Every tree, every river, every mountain, every rock has a kama, a spirit. This is the animistic thing. That's what animism is, believing there's a spirit in everything. And so the issue is, and in fact Confucius, uh, Confucius recognized that there were animistic spirits, but and he said, and you have to acknowledge them, but try not to pay attention to them if you can, that's what Confucius said. But so there is a lot of animism that comes out in this, and that again is inconsistent with those who would believe that worshiping spirits, especially spirits of rocks and trees, is not part of, or, you know, inanimate objects, so chairs, etc., is not part of what an orthodox religion Judaism, Islam, Christianity, most of all, is about. Okay? So let's talk about the three major ones we're looking at. First, Taoism. Um, the founder is Lao Tzu or Lao Tzu, although again there is a tradition, one tradition says he never actually existed. That he is, you know, he is a combination of various spiritual leaders uh, over time. Taoism, as I say here, is better understood not as a religion, but as a way of life. Not a religion because technically it does not recognize God, a God, in the sense that, that the Westerners. One of the dangers when we look at these religions, I had a question last week, I think, uh, when I was talking about um, the Sikh religion. And the question was, well, is this the God? Well, one of the difficulties is that that's a, applying Western mindset to this. I mean, I've studied this stuff quite a bit. I'm certainly no expert. I mean, you can come up with questions. I will not be able to answer on this stuff. Uh, because people study this stuff their whole life, you know, just one of these. But it's very difficult for us not to take our Western mindset in terms of a personal God and try to overlay it on this. Whereas Taoism is not theistic in the sense that it does not believe in a, a personal God. Rather, the focus is on the unity of the universe, the fact that there is Tao, that there is a force that's tying it all together. Uh, not only the material world, um, but the spiritual world, the past, the present, the future, all of that is part of the Tao, the flow, the force, sort of evolutionary force that goes through all things. Taoist theology and Taoism, there's, there is two real, and again, this is a very Western way to look at it. There is Taoist philosophy and then there is Taoist religion. A Taoist would say there's no difference. But some people would say, well, I'm not, I don't practice the religious part of this, but I do believe in the philosophy. Um, but they don't see the difference the way we think of them. Now, some uh, sort of popular Taoists would believe in a pantheon of divine beings. Divine beings doesn't necessarily mean God. It could be more like what we think of as angels or maybe even saints. Many of these are people. But the highest of the sort of deified figures in Taoism to the popular Taoism, that is the common people, excuse me, uh, would be called the Jade Emperor. Then along with the Jade Emperor, who is the top of these deified figures, they would also believe in spirits, spirits of their ancestors, spirits of, in nature, etc. Then there's a completely different level of sort of a elite or intellectual Taoism that does not focus on the Jade Emperor or, or even at all, but rather sees Lao Tzu 
the founder of what we now recognize as um, Taoism, as being the top of their pantheon of beings to revere, as the one who revealed all of this stuff. And they would focus much more on what happens internally rather than something external to yourself. They would not focus as much on spirits. Okay? In terms of Taoist doctrines, and by the way, you recognize that symbol up there, the, the yin and yang. This is a Taoist principle, and I'll get to the yin yang in a minute. They believe, first off, of the Tao and the Tei. Remember, the Tao is the flow of the universe, and the Tei is the active expression of Tao in a person and reflects their individual living and cultivating the Tao. Okay. They also believe and maintain, and this is a very important principle in Taoism, the Wu Wei. Wu Wei means non-action, or effortless action, or action without intent. In fact, they sometimes will talk about the Wei Wu Wei, which means action without action. The idea being, the flow is going along, get out of the way, nothing you do is going to make a difference. There is a kind of fatalism, although you won't read that often, I, I interpret it as a kind of fatalism in this, that Wu Wei means there is no deliberate action. There is nothing you can do. The force of Tao is going to keep flowing, and the best thing you can do is go along for the ride, but you're not going to change things. Okay? The Wu Wei, the inaction. They also maintain what's called the Siran, which is naturalness. The central value of Taoism is, as might, you might expect in terms of believing there's a force that runs through all of nature and all natural things, that there is a primordial state, there's an original sort of force uh, or state of all things, and the best way you can associate with that is spontaneity, creativity. A lot of artists in the Far East really see getting in touch with the Tao, focusing their, their key as being how they produce their art. Because this naturalness, and this is why Taoists have trouble with Confucianists. Because Confucius comes along and he puts it in terms of a system intended to give you a productive social order. To tell you, help you recognize your place in society and the needs of society, your place in, in your family and the needs of family, and then fulfill your obligations. A, a, a good Taoist would say, wow, that's so unnatural. And yet it's based upon some of the same principles. There is the yin and yang. Yin and yang, and that symbol you see in the upper left there, is the belief that there are opposite and contrary forces in the universe that are complementary and they're interdependent, and they give rise to each other as they integrate. Okay. Um, <coughs> get into the issue of, uh, in terms of European philosophy of dialectical, you know, um, there is thesis and antithesis and then synthesis kind of thing. There is this kind of philosophy exists in a lot of other places. But it is light and dark, true and false, right and wrong, up and down, good and bad. The idea that there's always two sides of things. So there is clearly, within Taoism, there is a sense of dualism. Dualism does not exist in the Orthodox religions, not pure dualism. In fact, I mentioned Zoroastrianism as one of the Iranian religions. Uh, again, there are not a lot of Zoroastrians out there today. There are some. Zoroastrianism is often listed as a monotheistic religion because they believe there is one God who is called Ahura Mazda. It has nothing to do with Zum Zum Nathakar. Ahura Mazda, though. And Ahura Mazda is seen as the creator, God, etc. But I don't think it's a monotheistic religion because Zoroastrianism maintains that there is a force of evil called Ahriman. And Ahura Mazda and Ahriman have been fighting tooth and nail throughout all of created time. And neither one can get the upper hand. Well, if the force of good, the God, cannot get the upper hand over evil, that's not monotheism, that's dualism. And so the yin and yang, that there's always counterbalancing forces, is very much a Taoist kind of belief. Okay? Now, um, Taoist terms and texts. The I Ching, how many of you all have ever heard of the I Ching? Okay. The symbol in the upper left, uh, this, it's hard to see in the black, sorry. Uh, it's, when you take a, a, a symbol like that, it's hard to change the color when you're putting it on that slide. The yin and yang in the middle, and then around the outside there are eight different uh, sections to what looks like a wheel. The I Ching is a system of divination, in other words, of uh, fortune telling, to use a common word, although that's not a particularly accurate word, uh, that was first uh, was originated sometime around 1150 BC, so we're talking 600 years 
before Taoism, Confucianism, etc. came along. And it is both a way of divining the future, and it's also a way to focus meditation amongst Taoists. It's also used by, um, I just read Philip, uh, Philip K. Dick's book, The Man in the High Castle. There's a TV show coming out on that. And in that, it represents the fact that the Japanese, who have conquered half of America, the Germans conquered the other half, that's the theme of the book, uh, that the Japanese are constantly stopping everything they're doing and casting the I Ching. What it is, it's, it's a series of eight either wands, that is, you know, sticks, or coins, each of which has a series of symbols on it. And when you cast them, you come up with some variation of 64 different hexagrams. There is an interpretation for each of those hexagrams. Now, they read like a horoscope. You know, they're not definitive. You know, it's not like buy high or sell low or whatever. Um, it's, it, you have to interpret them. In fact, some of the great writings, the second thing, the Tao Te Ching, is, is a book written by, historically written by, Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism, in which he, and it is the fundamental text of uh, philosophical Taoism, in which he interprets the various symbols, that the hexagrams that are possible within the I Ching. Now again, it's not just a way of deciding, you know, should I ask her out or not? You know, should I buy that car or not? Although people use it that way. It also is a focus of meditation to think about the consequences that might occur. And so it's more complicated than just like tarot cards, right? In terms of the philosophy and the meditation of it. It is distinctly not a Christian thing, in case you're wondering. Okay. Um, so they probably have experts that do this? Well, there are experts. I mean, there are people better at it, but everybody can do it. Oh, really? I mean, anybody, because you've got the book. You cast the wands of the I Ching, and then you pull out the Tao Te Ching, which is the book that Lao Tzu wrote, and you know the, the, each of these hexagrams, they have a, a, a number. And you go, oh, that's number 27. And you read the definition for number 27. And based upon how they're aligned, they also have, they will have a rising influence as well. You know, this is what this is what it means, but it may go to this. Okay? I'm getting into sort of describing fortune telling now, but that's that is how they use it. And it is common throughout the Far East, including in Japan. Um, so the Tao Te Ching is the fundamental, which is Lao Tzu's description, although some people again say that Lao Tzu didn't actually write it, his description of what the hexagrams of the I Ching mean, right? Um, there is another major text, which is the Zhuangzi, which is an ancient Chinese text, late 3rd century. It comes later than the uh, Tao Te Ching. It contains stories and anecdotes that exemplify what a true Taoist sage should look like. Again, the idea of how do you get there? Well, this is one of their major texts, and it describes, well, this is what it would look like if you are getting there, and this is, this is what you ought to emulate. Now, interestingly enough, the Zhuangzi is very much against Confucius, because the Zhuangzi says that Confucius took Lao Tzu's ideas and the writings of the, uh, the Tao Te Ching and others, and perverted it into the social system. And that's not what Taoism is all about. So Zhuangzi, the, and uh, Zhuangzi is not only the name of the book, it's also the name of the writer. He was a, um, a late third century sage or wise man in Taoism. And the, the Tao Te Ching, by the way, and there's different ways of spelling that, which is the thing that La, sometimes in China they just refer to that as the Lao Tzu or Lao Tzu. They name it for the person who they believe wrote it. You also have, in terms of text, the Tao Zhang. After Taoism was established, after Lao Tzu, there were hundreds of years in which various sages would interpret further the beliefs of the Tao, or Taoism, and would give further interpretations of what the hexagrams mean in the I Ching. There's like 1,500 different texts that constitute the core of the Taoist teaching. It was collected, finally collected in one place, about 480, so we're talking about eight to 900 years after Lao Tzu was alive, by various Taoist monks. Taoists do have monks, and there are priests um, in, in all of these religions. So you get some idea about that. These are the major texts, um, and the, the reason I mentioned the I Ching there, it's not a text, but it is the system on which much of their texts are focused. Okay, does that make sense? And I, I should say that within, let me go back one thing, um, the opening lines of the Tao Te Ching, 
Lao Tzu's writing on the I Ching, there are two famous lines. The two opening lines of the Tao Te Ching say, "The Tao is that uh, the Tao that cannot be told. That, sorry, the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. You can't nail it down." And the second line is, "The name that can be named is not the eternal name." This is not something. That's why the Western mindset, you know, give me the ten things I have to do to be a good Taoist. That's never going to happen. Because the whole point is it is a natural flow of things and you can't be too specific about that. The second of the major religions is Confucianism. The founder, Confucius, this is the statue of him represented here. And it's also called Ruism. That character, the Chinese character in the upper left, is the character Ru. It is the character for scholar. And so this is called Ruism by those who practice it. In fact, scholars, true scholars, would say that's a much better name than Confucianism, naming it after the guy who was technically the founder. What happened was Confucius took the Taoist ideas and he put it into a social order. He lived during a time when China had all kinds of problems, very disorderly, a lot of conflict, and he said, let me teach you how to have an orderly society. And it involves understanding that there is this flow in the natural world, Tao, and here's how you put it to work, making an orderly society and becoming a disciplined and responsible person. So it's a complex system of moral, social, political, and religious thought, complicated uh, system governing duties and etiquette, the focus being on familial duty, loyalty, and humaneness. Again, this moral focus. Now, there have been several periods. There was a period of Neo-Confucianism that occurred um, around um, 960 AD in which they formally and intentionally combined the principles of Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism into what's called Neo-Confucianism, and that's been the most influential. And then in the 20th century, they have what they call New Confucianism, which is kind of confusing because Neo means new. But Neo-Confucianism is about a thousand years old. The New Confucianism is less than a hundred years old, and it is an effort to try to apply that with an understanding of modern science, democratic ideals, modern, modern philosophy. Okay? So all of these things are still developing, even in the last hundred years, even though they are 2,500 years old. Now, Confucianism, text and terms, and the, the, the character in the upper left there, that is the, the character, the chop for Confucius. Okay. It is believed that Confucius wrote the five classics called the Wu Jin. They include the I Ching, which is his version of the interpretation of the I Ching. Um, although, again, the, the Taoist philosopher Zhuang Yi would say that Confucius messed everything up. Also, the classics of poetry, which is the earliest anthology of Chinese poems and songs. There is the Book of Documents, which is a collection of speeches uh, of the major figures of the time, a considerable period of time, and a record of major events. There is the Book of Rights, which is a description of the community that ought to exist based upon social responsibility, not on rules, but on everybody accepting their own social responsibility. And then the autumn, uh, Spring and Autumn Annals, which is the collective memory because remembering where you came from and what you're a part of is an important part of Confucianism. There's a major focus on the Tian, which is one, one way to translate that is heaven or the divine. It is similar to the Tao in Confucianism. It's sort of a manifestation of the Tao. It, the goal in Confucianism is to become righteous enough and disciplined enough and part of the social order enough that you unite yourself with Tian. But that's not like Buddhism, where you're going to be united to, you know, to the eternal and achieve nirvana. It simply means you get it right, finally. Then there are, within Confucianism, the five constants, they're called. The constants are humaneness, I'm not going to bother you with the Chinese words for these. Humaneness, justice, proper ritual, remember it's a very ritualistic sort of thing. Going through the ritual keeps you on the right track. You need to do things in a certain way. Knowledge and integrity, the five constants. And then there are the four virtues. Always got to have shorthand for this stuff so people can remember it. The four virtues are loyalty, filial piety, which means dedication to family. Loyalty and support for family. Reliability and righteousness. These are all principles within Confucianism. They were Confucius' way of interpreting the principles of Tao in a practical kind of way, which the Taoists never did like, although they all, after arguing and literally fighting each other for centuries, they finally got together sometime around 1000 AD and 
and started working together and developed the Neo-Confucianism, which has become the dominant kind of focus. Since the 2000s, like in the last 20 years, into the 1900s, early in 2000s, intellectuals and students in China have been pushing for Confucianism to be officially identified more in China. Remember, it's not one of the five technically approved religions in China, oddly enough, even though it's probably had more influence on the development of Chinese culture than any of the other specific ones. A particular Confucian intellectual in 2003 published a manifesto in which he recommended four things. He said Confucian education should be, should be applied at every level of education in China. Secondly, that the state should establish Confucianism as the state religion. Third, that Confucian religion should enter into the daily life of every ordinary people by standardizing daily ritual and requiring that. And fourth, that the Confucian religion should be spread through not only government approval, but non-governmental organizations. In other words, you've got to do this. So there's a big move recently for Confucianism to be not only more widely acknowledged in China, but applied, even required. Some intellectuals, now the government of China has not made any move in that direction, but that's kind of the push that people are making nowadays. The third of the major religions we're talking about is Shinto, or in Japanese, the Kami no Michi. Shinto literally means the way of the gods, or the way of the spirits. Kama, or kami, as here in this word, are the, the spirits, the animistic spirits, or the gods. It is an animistic folk religion. Its roots go back long before it formally was created, around the same time, around 500. But there are ancient traditions. The, the picture that you have on the right is an image of the creation of the Japanese islands, the Japanese arch, uh, archipelago, archipelago. And these are two gods. Izanagi is the male god, which means he who invites. And Izanami is the female god, she who is invited. And the interaction, shall we say, between these two ancient kama, or spirits, divine beings, were seen as the result of that was the Japanese islands. And so this goes back to the farthest reaches of Japanese memory, but was formalized into religious beliefs of Shinto sometime around 2,500 years ago, okay? It is uniquely a Japanese religion. As I said before, to be Japanese means to at least have some association with the religion of Shinto, even if you're also a practicing Buddhist, and even if you say you, you don't believe in religion. Everybody is involved in this in some way. It is the largest religion in Japan. About 80% of Japanese participate, well, identify themselves as Shintos in uh, various kinds of surveys. There are, in Japan, and Japan's not a very big country, it's very densely populated, but within the country of Japan, there are about approximately 81,000 Shinto shrines and 85,000 Shinto priests in that country. Okay? Um, so it is a major force, and even the forms of Buddhism that exist there, like Pure Land Buddhism, which kind of believes there's a Pure Land heaven, sort of a heaven kind of figure, it is very deeply tied to the Shinto faith. As I said, most Japanese, they will identify themselves as Shinto because that's what it means to be Japanese, but they will often practice Buddhism as well. And so there is this combination of things. There is a strong affirmation of family tradition, of family values, of nature, of cleanliness, it's Japan, after all, and a ritual observance within this. Now, some of the types of Shinto, because they vary widely within that one country, there is Shrine Shinto, which is the most common. It is the, the, the one that's been around longest in the current form. It involves worship and events at local public shrines. Now, again, this is the state religion. In fact, after the Second World War, the Western allies had to suppress Shinto because Shinto had been used by the emperor and more so the cronies of the emperor in order to try to encourage a dedication that led to the Japan, Japanese aggression in, you know, that's why there was so much sort of religious fervor in the Japanese military uh, efforts in the Second World War. And so there was some suppression of that. But Shrine Shinto is the one that is most common. Most of those shrines are public. They were built by the government. There is also the Imperial Household Shinto, which is exclusive to the royal family, and it's practiced at one of three imperial shrines within the imperial properties. There is Folk Shinto, which is closer tied to uh, animistic spirits and local deities. It's more the folk version of it, out in the countryside. There is Sect Shinto, which is like a private version of it, as opposed to the public Shrine Shinto, 
Um, it is private groups that develop communities and build their own shrines and practice their own sort of slightly varied version of Shinto. And that has gotten more common. And then there is an effort to try to reform or revert or restore Shintoism called the, the Ko Shinto, literally Old Shinto. A modern effort to try to go back to the old way of doing things in Shintoism. Okay? All of those are existing today. And there are others as well, you know, faction Shinto and other kinds of new religions that are related to this. In terms of theology, there are a number of different beliefs that Shinto maintains. Um, and by the way, that image, did I? Okay. That image up there is a Shinto image which represents humanity, earth, and sky. This image in the upper left, um, and actually that's not a very good version of it, I realize right now looking at it, um, in every, as you approach every Shinto shrine, or often a Shinto household, there will be what's called a Torii. Torii, T-O-R-I-I, is a gate which usually will have two cross pieces, that's why that's not a very good version of it. And it is seen as the gate between earthly existence and heavenly existence, between earth and heaven. Okay. So, among the beliefs, the belief in Kami, which could be translated God, but more properly spirit, the spiritual essence that inhabits all things, animate or not. Now, it's called an animistic religion because it believes in the spirits, but that includes the spirit of the trees. Trees are alive. Spirit of the rocks, spirit of the river, spirit of the mountain. There's a lot of that kind of thing, and that includes ancestors. Your ancestors are kami. When uh, Izanagi and Izanami, the two sort of creator gods, when they created the islands, they created a whole new set of kami because all of the created physical world that they were responsible for, and just the focus is on the islands of Japan, all of the pieces that they put into that all represent a spirit, a kami. Yes? I'm just wondering, what would a shrine, a Shinto shrine, look like? It would have everything. It would have... Well, usually, I mean, it's always uniquely Japanese architecture. And um, if you you walk through Torii, there's always a Torii at the entrance. And it will be, um, usually they will have multiple buildings. There will be one that is a private, you know, where you can go for private um, offerings to the kami and recognition of the kami. There will be a public hall, and then usually a public use area, a larger public use area. But um, it, it will have usually sp spiked tops and, the, you know, the raised, Eaves on the top, the top, the center of the, you know, each of the building. Think of a Japanese, you know, what is what comes to mind when you think of a Japanese building? You know, that's that right. Japanese architecture is always represented in, in the shrines. People go there and they meditate. They meditate. They offer offer things to the kami. Again, it's animistic, and one of the natures of animistic religions is often it means you have to do something to satisfy the spirits so they don't hurt you. You know, <laughs> it's an offering. Um, and as I've said, especially in, in parts of Asia or uh, you know, even some parts of South America, but mostly Asia, people will go places that are Buddhist or Shinto or whatever, and there will be these little spirit houses. They're usually bright, brightly painted and beautiful, and there will be offerings there. And people from the West go there and go, isn't that cute? <laughs> well, actually, that's done in an effort to keep the spirits from hurting you, to try to satisfy them in some way. It's really not cute. Okay? Um, I don't think. My own personal opinion. Um, fruit. Um, in fact, there's a specific, in Shinto, there's a specific list. You offer them rice, you offer them rice wine, um, sake, you offer them certain kinds of fruit. It's very specific. They have an exact, there's a name, Japanese is very organized, an exact name for what they offer in a standard kind of offering. There can be other things too, but the standard offering is established. They also have the belief in Shinto in the Kanagara, meaning, meaning the way of the Kami, the natural order of things. Sound familiar? The natural order, the flow how the spirits exist, and it is it, similar to the Tao. It's kind of their interpretation of the Tao. Yes, Grace. Have you lived in Hawaii? You might enjoy this. The American Orientals would take uh, sake and food on the graves, right. and the Holy or the Caucasian American would say, you think your friend's going to come up and eat that? And he said, the same time, your friend's going to come up and smell the flowers. Exactly. You guys heard that? That the, um, the Asian, particularly, would be the Japanese, who take rice wine, sake, and, and fruit and other things and put it on the graves of their ancestors. Because the ancestors are coming. And so the offering put on the graves of ancestors is an effort to, it's an offering to the kami, to the spirits. 
Well, she, Grace just said that the, the Westerners would say to, particularly the Japanese probably, you know, yeah. do you really think your ancestor is going to come up out of the grave and eat that? And the Japanese would say, well, you know, do you think that your ancestors are going to come up out of the grave and smell the flowers you put out there? <laughs> so, it's a different perception. So the Kanagata is the way of the kami, the flow, very much like the Tao kind of idea. There is also the belief in the Amen Omenaka Nushi. The Amen Okanaka Nushi, again, this is not, these are not theistic religions per se. And yet, within that, even though they would say we don't believe in God in the Western sense, the uh, Amen Okanaka Nushi is the heavenly ancestral God of the originating part of the universe. That's what that word means. In other words, that is the first kami, the first spirit, and the source of the universe. He is, in effect, using Western terms, no offense to the Shintos are here, um, in Western terms, that would mean the Creator God. He is the first. Right? And so they do have a belief in these various levels of divine beings. This is the highest one. They also have, as I said before, a particular belief in creation, that the Japanese islands came from the product of two gods, Izanagi and Izanami, who between them created the, the Japanese islands, and that's their real focus, that's the real world. There's also a big focus, don't have a slide about this, on the need to, to stay away from impurity, ritual impurity. Uh, this is the reason why the Shintos don't have a big, you know, don't have a good theology of dealing with the dead, because dead bodies are impure. And they do have a theology of hell. In fact, all dead people go to um, a place which is the valley, which is not a very pleasant place, they think. The nomi, they, they, uh, the place of shadows, kind of darkness. And that's why a lot of Shintos, when it comes to burying their dead, they'll practice more of a Buddhist kind of approach, because that's more positive. Impurity you stay away from. There are, there are processes for purification rites. It's done daily, weekly, seasonally, lunar, annual basis. This is the reason why, why there are a proliferation of bathhouses, of, you know, Japanese tubs, right? I actually was staying one time at the New York Tiny Hotel in Los Angeles. I was with a client, and a, there was another guy with me. At that time, I weighed about 240. Okay, I'm almost 50 pounds less than that now. He's bigger than I was. Well, we went into a spa there at the New Otani Hotel, and they have these tubs. And it's the, the tubs are floor level, and then there's this tile floor. Well, he and I, these two big white boys, jumped down in these tubs, and man, we had waves flowing across that floor. You know? Well, the Japanese, the, the reason why they have that in the spa there is because that's part of the Japanese process on a virtually daily basis. And they, the New Otani Hotel is a Japanese hotel. <laughs> and the, a lot of Japanese clients are coming to Los Angeles, and so that's part of what they do. They also do have a belief in the afterlife, but their view of the, the Yomi, as I said, is close to the Greek idea of Hades, a place of shadows and of darkness. Um, and as I mentioned, the last thing I'll say is about the shrines. There are the formal shrines, the buildings, but then they also have what they call Mori, which are natural sites of shrines. Uh, Japanese gardens, you know, if you go to a public Japanese garden, that's considered a holy place to somebody who's a good Shinto because the beauty, and the reason the beauty of that, why do they rake the sand in beautiful patterns? Is because they believe that one of the ways that you can, you can acknowledge the kami, the natural spirit of things, is by having a place of beauty. There are mountains. Mount Fuji, for instance, is considered a mori, a, a natural location where the kami are to, can be recognized and where they especially reside. So all of that is part of it. Okay, I've gone over six minutes. Any questions that are burning here? Yes, Caroline. What does it mean when it's like they say to lose space? To lose space. That's not so much a Shinto belief, but it's part of the culture. Um, to, to lose space means to be embarrassed in any way, to, to lose respect. And respect for one another and to have respect yourself is considered one of the highest values. And so the Japanese culture, and this is reflected too in Shinto, uh, losing face means that you in any way have been embarrassed. And, to, and sometimes in history, losing face would be sufficient for someone to commit supoku, which is harikiri, you know, the cutting of the entrails. Um, because having respect, having being in the right place, being respected, you know, not being embarrassed or shamed is hugely important. Because, and one of the reasons that this is related, one of the reasons is that if you are shamed, then you bring shame on your ancestors, the kami, that are your predecessors. Okay, and so that's all, it, it is related in that way. Other questions? Okay, you now know about the Taoic religions, or the religions of the Far East. 
you have any other questions, please come up to me afterwards, and I will see you next week when we will talk about, of all things, Christianity. Thanks for coming. Have a great day.